This was occupied by an inland swamp known as the Illinois Basin. It occupied most of Illinois and we were sort of on the eastern edge. Maybe a hundred feet down, there, there are coal seams. Coal was mined here during the Civil War and about 70 years after that. I was told by an authority on fossil plants that the ancient horsetails that grew in that swamp were 100 feet tall. We're going to see some descendants of those horsetails down along the creek today that are about two feet tall. So that's the maximum height they get. In, they've really come down in the last 300 million years. And now we'll jump forward about a, a few million years. About 10,000 years ago, this was at the southern edge of the last glaciation. The, the edge of the glacier was somewhere right in this area. And so the same forces that carved the sandstone canyons of Shades and Turkey Run, the melting of the glaciers, created Atherton Island. The glaciers dump gravel and sand right here. And this is sandy and gravel beneath the, the soil. And you'll see it as we walk the creek. And along the creek, you'll see many boulders with uh, striations from the glaciers. So it was formed by the glaciers dropping their debris here. And then the Native Americans we know inhabited this area. There was an orchard here. Wherever we cultivated a garden, we found Indian artifacts up here. And it's a, really a perfect place. Uh, you can go to certain points here at Atherton Island and you get this lovely panoramic view of the Wabash Valley. You can just see for miles north. The Native Americans occupied this land until 1809 when William Henry Harrison forced the Indians to sign a treaty called the 10 o'clock line treaty and the land was ceded to white settlers. Best records I have was the first white settler here. Uh, the two first white settlers were uh, Mary Smith and James Smith, 1893, uh, and it's been occupied ever since. Uh, my, we had an orchard here until 1970. We sold it to uh, someone who was going to maintain the orchard. Well, it was never maintained. It passed through five different owners between 1970 and 1993. And when I bought it back in 93, it was in a deplorable, there was junk everywhere. The road was washed out, old school buses, people had dumped the refrigerators, stoves, you name it. And so over the years, we planted a prairie on the ridges and we maintained it for about five years. And then I decided, you know, this was really a hardwood forest, oak hickory forest. And so we're letting it naturally return to a hardwood forest. We still have remnants of the prairie plants. As you walk this in the summertime, there are lots of echinacea and cup plants and rosin weed, but we find little oak trees coming up. There are walnut trees, persimmon trees. So I think it's undergoing a, a good a natural succession. Uh, the multiflora rose and viney honeysuckle are a problem, but I've discovered with time as the trees mature, these are shaded out and they disappear. Now, eventually the, the woods, the trees will move in. Uh, we have a lot of sumac. It's one of the, uh, one of the uh, shrubs that moves in, uh, one of the first shrubs to move in during natural uh, plant succession. But it, it will soon die out and be replaced by the trees. 
Like I said, this is here's a here's a little white oak tree that's come up. So we're, that, it came up on its own. And this, like I said, this was planted in prairie about 20 years ago. So in the summer, you'll see uh, prairie plants here on the edge. Yeah. And uh, why I'm stopping here is uh, I wanted to tell you why I uh, uh, a little something about this oak tree. In a few weeks. It will look something like this. Wow. It will be covered with these gall, insect galls. Years ago, I took one of these to see who lived in here. There are two, about 200 little wasps that come from oh, here. Wow. And there are ten, they're 10 times the number of female wasps as there are male wasps. These, these, they have, um, they alternate with a sexual generation and an asexual generation. This is the sexual generation. Here's another species that, that lives here. This is found on what are called the oak apples. So it's a different species. Each wasp has its own distinctive gall. Uh, this one is formed on red oak. This is called the wool sower's gall, gall because it looks like a ball of wool. You can just pass those around. That's what these little wasps are like. Are they harmful to the tree or no? no the, the, the trees seem to be perfectly content. Uh, and so one of the reasons I brought this up is here at Atherton Island, you know, it's, it's a sanctuary for not just the charismatic uh, creatures like deer, mm -hmm. but the, all the little creatures, because these are the ones that really keep things going. Uh, one of the reasons we have such a diverse wildflower uh, population here is because of the little creatures that create the rich humus in the soil. So if you take some of the soil from uh, Atherton Island and, and look at the creatures that are in there most of they're microscopic you know one millimeter two millimeter and like, but these are little mites and they're called springtails that break down the the leaf litter and make the soils so enriched here uh, in a place like Minnesota I, I'm mentioning this there there's an invasion of exotic earthworms and what these earthworms are doing is removing this litter from the surface and consequently, uh, the, the forests of Minnesota are now depauperate of ma many of their wildflowers. So we take, it, we take these little creatures for granted, but they're essential in creating the, the conditions that make the, uh, the growth of these wa uh, wildflowers possible. And uh, we're just, I'm gonna just take you on a short diversion here. This, these were at one time extremely common, extremely common. The larvae feed, this is the female, this is the male. They're the giant silk moths, native, our native silk moths. Um, and you would find hundreds of them on the, the twigs of uh, sassafras. And cherry in the, in the winter time. Uh, I have found hardly any in the last few years. And I'm not sure why. I, I think uh, the new pesticides that are being used are probably partially responsible, the neonicotinoids. And the reason I brought them here is because I was so excited because earlier this winter I found two cocoons. And I have looked over the, I have carefully looked over the entire acreage, the new acreage in here. There are lots of sassafras and wild cherry to look at. And this is the only spot where I found them. So um, I'll just take you back there. And the other reason I'm taking you back is we're, we're going to see one of our first wildflowers. Um, uh, one of the more spectacular ones called fire pink. Yeah. And they're, they're, see, they're coming here. And there's a jack in the pulpit. So we should see lots of those. Solomon seal has the flowers along the main axis. And the false Solomon seal has the flowers at the end of the axis. Those are in the lily family. 
the oaks are coming in, so it should regenerate nicely. It just takes patience. We, we still have problems with the honeysuckle, but it's really diminished now as the trees get older. Dutchman's breeches, it's in the same genus, Dicentra, as Dutchman's breeches. It's called squirrel corn. And it, uh, the Dutchman's breeches look like breeches, whereas squirrel corn looks like a bleeding heart, a cultivated bleeding heart, ex except it's white. And we've got some of that growing further down the road. They, they're, they're past their prime, but they look like bleeding hearts. Oh, see okay, that's There's the a one. little. And the jack in the pulpits are just coming out now. After we have the white, big white trillium, trillium grandiflorum. And I checked on it this morning and I noticed that a couple had been eaten by deer. Deer, unfortunately, likes to crop trillium. This is a little flower that most people don't notice. It's called smooth rock crest. It's in the, it's in the mustard family and it's blooming right now. It has these pointed leaves. It's a small little inconspicuous flower, but it, it has an interesting story to tell. This is a uh, Virginia water leaf, and we'll see more of this as we go into the woods. The yellow flowers are the celandine poppies. See the leaves on the, on the other side of the ravine? Those are wild leeks. And they're one of those plants that send out their leaves and photosynthesize early in the spring, and then they die back, and then they send out their flowers in August. Wild leeks, wild leeks. So they won't bloom until later in the year. This is blue cohosh. Blue cohosh, and we, we'll see some in bloom. This is blooming right now. Here's, here's a, a, a blue cohosh that's coming into bloom. It has a little yellow flower. And I think when we go to the creek, we'll see uh, some in full bloom. Blue cohosh, there's black cohosh. Here's some spring beauty. The spring beauty's already set seed here. And here's Dentaria or toothwort. Here's the remnants of a, of a toothwort. Nodding trillion. They have a beautiful white flower. Oh, that's spice bush. That's spice. Take a leaf and smell it. This is an indicator of really rich, undisturbed woodland. And it's, it's getting ready to bloom. The common name is doll's eyes because the fruit, the fruit that appears in late summer is white with a black center. It looks like a doll's eye. But the here's the flower cluster, and it will be white. And it's just unfurling now. There, there are actually quite a few in this area. Oh, a wild geranium is starting. Great. Here's a wild geranium. The ferns, fiddleheads are unfurling. We have 12 species of ferns here at Atherton Island. So that's, that's the Christmas fern. On this hillside, we have New York fern. And we'll see more ferns when we go to the creek. One of the easiest plants to identify, one of the most ephemeral of the spring ephemerals is bloodroot. The bloom lasts about two or three days. Bloodroot. If you take the root out, it, it's used in herbal medicine too. The, it looks, it just, you open the root and it bleeds like red blood. Bright red. But please don't ever do it because that <laughs> kills the plant. This is the trout lily. These bloomed at least a week ago. You can see how open and lovely this woods is. The main trees here are basswood red oak, black oak, and a few white oaks.
There's a red-headed woodpecker family here. We're excited about that because red-headed woodpecker populations have been on the decline for quite a while. When we were walking in the new 80 acres to the east of here, uh, in one of the ravines, we saw more red-headed woodpeckers. Wow. So we have at least two families of red-headed woodpeckers. And we're also pleased that we have a family of bobcats. I don't hunt, but I, I let a local hunter hunt here because he keeps an eye on the land. And he has cameras set up everywhere, and so he's rec he records the wildlife for us. And he was the one who showed us the, the film of the mother bobcat leading the two kittens oh, cool. along, along the creek that we'll go to. We have lots of pileated woodpeckers here. And like I said, we have 39 species of trees. If you count the white pine, it's 40. We have 12 species of ferns. And we're hoping to get a, an expert on grasses and sedges to identify our grasses and sedges for us, just to get an inventory of the species diversity. And like I said, it's, it's very diverse because of the, the complex topography of this place. One of the reasons we, you have such diversity here is the different little microclimates. You have south-facing slopes that get lots of sun. You have north-facing slopes that get less sun. And so you'll see a, a definite pattern. There are certain species that like the north-facing slopes. There are certain species that like the south-facing slopes. There's an unusual violet that grows in here too called green violet. Well, we have a lot of ash trees, but we don't have the ash borer. Well, you know, it's coming. We're going to see several mints along the creek, one called pagoda plant that has a definitely strong scent. These are black oaks. Those of you who know about mushrooms, if we have a wet September, wet October, you get a nice growth of chicken of the woods. This big mushroom that grows at the base of only red oaks and black oak. And it, the Japanese know it as maitake. It's, it's one of those herbal mushrooms. We have squaw root here, and we, these are parasitic plants that associate with the, the roots of uh, the oak trees. We have squaw root. It's, it's a parasitic plant. Instead of being green, it's brownish. It's a creamy brown. And uh, there's another one that, uh, called beech drops. It's only found under beech trees. The beech trees that we'll encounter at the bottom of this trail have beech drops every, every September they bloom. And they're a, wine, they're a creamy white color. And they look like little sticks about this tall. They, uh, they associate with the the fungus, the mycorrhizal fungus that are associated with the plant roots. And so they obtain their nutrients from both the, the fungus and the tree. This is a rare plant. It's called monument plant. And I do not understand the flowering cycle. I don't, I'm not sure that anyone understands the flowering cycle. I had this land for 20 years before I saw a single one bloom. But when it blooms, the, the inflorescence, the flower stalk, is about six feet tall. Last year we had one that bloomed. Each flower is like this. It's really spectacular. And on this hillside, this is a, a south-facing slope. You can see the little creek down there. In a few weeks, the fire pinks will come out on this slope here. They, they love this south-facing slope. Most people associate plants called tick trefoils with the prairie. But there are two species of woodland tick trefoil which grow along this ridge. One of them has the, the flower stalk that comes from the very center of the plant, and the other one has a flower stalk that comes from the very base and curves around the leaves. In the summertime, there are lots of flowers along here. So the, in the summer, this is a rich ridge for plants. Uh, you have uh, 
a plant in the, the rose family called agrimony. That's a basswood. See the heart shape? Yeah, that's a basswood. And here's a little, here's a little hickory. There are lots of trout lilies on this trail. A little member of the lily family. Can you see the flower? It's called bellwort. Uh, this ridge was covered with trout lilies. You can see the mottled leaves here. We have one species of rush. Rushes make up their own family called the juncaceae, and most of them are associated with wetlands. But there's one that grows here on the ridges, and this is it. It's a rather, in, it's in flower right now. And it's called wood rush. Like I said, it's about the only species that is found outside of a, a wetland. And it has this wonderful scientific name of Luzula. Luzula. You can see the, there are more uh, flowers on the pawpaw here. These, are, these pawpaws are blooming. There's ginseng. In fact, uh, there was ginseng on this ridge. There's actually quite a bit of ginseng. Unfortunately, we can't keep out the ginseng, honey. You know, they, they, yeah. But that one ridge that we walked a few minutes ago, that was just rich with ginseng. This is the swamp buttercup, and the buttercup family is called Ranunculaceae, and this is the type genus, Ranunculus swamp buttercup, and we'll see quite a bit of this. That's a nettle, stinging nettle. And, and oh, there's another plant here I wanted to point out. Let's see if I can find it. Here it is. Okay, this is Valeriana. It's, an, it's a valerian, wild valerian. It has a cluster of pink flowers, but they'll bl they won't bloom until next month. So there, there are actually quite a few along the creek. They're hard to spot until they get their flowers on them. It's a native, yeah, it's a native. Wild valerian. Valerian is used as a sedative, a sleep yeah, inducer. Really? Sleep in, you can buy valerian root, health food stores. This is valeriana. It's, an, it's a valerian, yeah. wild valerian. And it has, <laughs> it's Valeriana pausiflora, which means small flower, but it has a cluster of pink flowers, but they'll bl they won't bloom until next month. So there, there are actually quite a few along the creek. And they're hard to spot until they get their flowers on them. Here's this, the ragwort again, Senecio. These are the horsetails that I talked about. Their ancestors were 100 feet tall, and this is what they've been reduced to. Descendants of the ancient coal swamps. This is a special hillside. From that cusp, that ridge there, to that ridge, you can see the bowl-like depression. It's fairly shaded. That is where there are hundreds of snow trillions. It's a white flower, three petals, three leaves. Everything's in threes. What's interesting is it's just such a sharp demarcation from that cusp to that cusp, and that you find snow trilliums nowhere else in the woods. And the other plant that grows with the snow trilliums are hepatica. And the hepatica have already bloomed. And they have those distinctive three-part leaves. They were named after the liver. 
because the liver has those lobes. And according to the doctrine of signatures, in the Middle Ages, they thought that you could use hepatica to treat liver ailments. Look at all the hepatica here. When I was a child, there was a gravel bank here and it was inhabited every summer by a colony of what are called toad bugs. They're about a half an inch long. They, they look just like a toad. They hop like a toad, they have bulging eyes like a toad, and they have warts like a toad. And they inhabited that bank and they blended in perfectly with the little pieces of gravel. They were the same, they had an assortment of colors, little browns, dark, light. And so when I came back, I kept looking, but the toad bugs are gone. There were also some gall insects on willows here, and those have gone. But the plants are still here. The plants have remained after all these years. And who knows how many millennia those uh, snow trilliums have been there. We have crayfish. We have two-line salamanders that lay their eggs in this stream. And the, the stream is inhabited by a, a lovely damselfly, the iridescent green with black wings, the genus Coleopteryx, which means beautiful wings. You have the nymphs of those that develop here in the stream, and the stream is also known for its winter stonefly. So if you come here on a reasonably warm day in January or February or December, you'll see little stoneflies. Their nymphs live in the water, and they emerge from the water and, and feed on lichens and algae on the tree trunks. Lots of white violets, white violets, yeah, we have four species of violets here. This is the mint that grows along the creek. It's called, the common name is pagoda plant. Can you see why? It has the, it's blepharium, and it has a, a lovely scent. It smells something like oregano. Let's see if it has it. It has a square stem too. There are plants that have square stems that are not mints. One of our prairie plants, cup plants, has a, a square stem. It's certainly not a mint. When I was a kid, there were lots of wood frogs. Do you know the wood frogs? Rana sylvatica? Yeah. You know, they're very distinctive. They have a mask like a raccoon, dark rims around their, their eyes. We have lots of barred owls here. There's a barred owl that roosts by the Quonset hut, and you can see its pellets. Little mouse jaw bones and a mouse skull and a bird beak. <laughs> screech owls tiny, barred owls, I think barred owls will eat screech owls. The barred owl is two or three times the size of a screech owl. Bill and I want to thank Britton Luther for help making this possible. Britton has a degree in, in uh, civil engineering from Purdue, and we went to Britton for advice about putting up the bridge. We, we had a, originally we had a wooden bridge over there, but the bank was eroding thanks to cultivation in the east 80 acres. You know, that's going to stop now because we're going to plant trees there. But Britton advised us to put it here, and he was the one who found out about this particular model. So this would not have been possible without Britain's help. Thank you, Britain. So this, this enables us to connect all trails, original 80 acres, the 30 acre addition, and the 80 acre addition to the east. There's a trail that winds up the hill, and about a mile to the east is the south entrance to Atherton Island, where we'll have a parking lot. So this would not have been possible without Britain's help. Thank you, Britain. Wow. Thank you.
There's another species of wildflower on the other bank. It's called miterwort. It's in the saxifrage family. It's related to coral bells, the cultivated coral bells. Miterwort. It's in the it's in the same family as coral bells. You just find it on these uh, north-facing slopes. Miterwort. It's in the it's in the same family as coral bells. You just find it on these uh, north-facing slopes. When I lived here, we never logged anything. But after we sold it, the owners started logging. And there were some magnificent white oaks, big white oak trees up there. And of course, they took those out. So when I came back, I looked up there, and there were black locusts popping up among the, the, the shagbark hickory and the white oak. So the first winter, I spent girdling those black locusts. And now, it's just, it's a beautiful stand of white oak trees that are like this and shagbark hickory that are like this. And it was true on that, that knob over there. They had logged it and the black locusts had moved in. They're invasive species. I girdled all those and now the white oaks, tulip trees, and shagbark hickory are filling in the area. Oh, we're going to plant all uh, white oak, black oak, red oak, chinkapin oak, bur oak, all the native oaks. We're going to plant persimmon, tulip tree, walnut, Kentucky coffee tree, hybrid butternut. And then we're also going to plant a four acre short grass prairie with um, about 40 species of wildflowers. Wow. So, uh, and, some, and short grasses. We've learned over from my experience with prairie restoration, you want to avoid adding tall grass because it eventually takes over the prairie. So this way we should have the, the prairie should be dominated by a few grasses and lots of flowers. And we're excited about the birds that will come back, hopefully.